Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. Happy Monday. Uh, fantastic show playing for you today. It is the Monday after roll call. It is the Monday after our first ever roll call event. And man, if you can look on the face, on my face, I'm well pleased, I'm happy, I'm thrilled. I'm still on an emotional high uh, from what we experienced uh, this weekend at Roll Call. We're going to talk about Roll Call with TJ Moe and uh, David Shannon, uh, Chocolate Knox, the Idaho Potato. Uh, we're gonna do it though, not in great, great detail because we're going to save a little bit more detail for Wednesday when Anthony's here and Virgil joins us and well, that'll be a part of Tennessee Harmony. And when we can start unpacking some of the video from Roll Call, I know I've heard from a lot of you all that weren't able to attend and you want to see some videos. We'll show some pictures today, uh, particularly when we uh, talk with uh, uh, when we talk with Dave Shannon. So <clears throat> anyway, we'll show some of Roll Call, we'll talk some Roll Call today, but we're gonna talk about Russell Westbrook and how he relates to Roll Call also today. But before we do any of that, before I get into my fire starter, I, I wanna talk about uh, my inspiration and what keeps me going preborn. You guys know I love preborn, you know I love the work that they do, you know that we love the work that they do. And at Roll Call, many people stop me and uh, talk with me about preborn and their ability uh, to help women choose life when they're contemplating abortion. Uh, one uh, attendee stopped me and tried to put cash in my hand. I was like, Jason, we gotta pass the collection plate for preborn. And, and I was like, I'm a little busy. I don't want people stuffing money into my hands. I don't know if I'll remember and take care of it. I was like, Let, let's, Go to preborn.com slash Jason. Uh, let's hit pound 250 and say the keyword baby. Let's continue to support preborn that way. But I love the enthusiasm of, of the attendees and the man that stopped me and, and wanted to do that. You guys are buying in uh, to this whole mindset that we're promoting about preborn and how life begins in the womb. And that's how we know and prepare ourselves to treat life well outside the womb, that's what preborn does. Preborn helps you in the womb and outside the womb. A woman that is contemplating abortion, they provide an ultrasound uh, that introduces that baby to the mother, to the expectant mother. She sees the baby, she hears the baby's heartbeat, and she is like 70, 80% more likely to choose life. They've saved more than 200,000 babies' lives. We here at The Blaze and Fearless, we're gonna say personally through The Blaze and Fearless, we're gonna save 50,000 babies' lives this year uh, by supporting preborn. It's just $28 for one ultrasound, uh, $140 for five ultrasounds. Thank you so much this weekend for getting in my face and telling me about preborn. It lets me know the work we're doing here and the promotion we're doing here is working and is touching you. Let's continue to do that work. Preborn.com slash Jason or say the keyword baby at pound 250. Pound 250, say the keyword baby, or do it the Jason Whitlock way, preborn.com slash Jason. Take care of our friends and our mission with preborn. Uh, let's get into uh, my mono because it connects to roll call and what I was promoting at roll call and, and the message, particularly the ending message uh, of Roll Call, and it's a, I'm gonna connect Russell Westbrook, the uh, LA Clippers basketball star, and an incident that went on him last night to my message uh, during Roll Call. So let's get this fire started. Anything and everything triggers the godless. They live for the approval of man, not God. They seek affirmation from people who don't know them. They prioritize the perception of worldly respect over pleasing the most high. Russell Westbrook embodies the godless celebrity elite. His fragile ego controls him. His identity is a divorce from God. He's an NBA superstar, a fashion and commercial brand. The tiniest thing that infringes on his brand triggers an emotional outrage. 
Sunday night at halftime of the LA Clippers upset of the Phoenix Suns in the first round of the NBA playoffs. Westbrook bars into a ground floor lounge and confronted a fan who apparently had been heckling him or heckled him on his way to the locker room as he walks to the locker room at halftime. Take a look for yourself. Can you imagine that? I mean, the confrontation, like everything else in modern America, was captured on a cell phone video. Fans have been heckling athletes for more than 100 years. This is the first time I can remember an athlete barging into a lounge to berate a fan. But it's not that surprising. The relationship between athletes and fans has been rapidly deteriorating for at least two decades. 19 years ago, the Indiana Pacers declared war on Detroit Pistons fans inside the palace. Then NBA Commissioner David Stern sided with his paying customers, issuing harsh suspensions and fines against <clears throat> Ron Artest, Steven Jackson, and several other Pacers for fighting with Pistons fans. Looking to maintain access to the athletes, many elite media members sided with the players. In the nine years of Adam Silver's reign as commissioner of the NBA, the divide between basketball players and fans has grown much worse. Adam Silver is petrified of the players. It's now common for NBA players to have paying customers ejected from the arena for shouting things players used to laugh off and or dismiss. There, remember, I grew up at a time where people, business people said the customer is always right. The NBA says the customer is always wrong. The players dismiss very little today. They are their own gods. Taunts are blasphemy. Their self-esteem is directly tied to the level of worship they receive. This weekend, at the inaugural Fearless Army Roll Call Men's Summit, I ended my speech talking about the importance of men embracing their identities in Christ. I asked the more than 700 men assembled to toss aside the political, sexual, racial, and work identities and identify first, foremost, and only as Christians. If Russell Westbrook's sole identity was Christian, he would not be bothered at all by what a fan shouts at him. He would be living a life to win God's respect and realize the futility and worthlessness of man's respect. Westbrook has rabbit ears and is in constant controversies with fans and media because he's seeking the approval of the wrong people. He has accused Utah Jazz, Jazz fans of bigotry. He scolded a small child who playfully touched him courtside. For years, Westbrook attempted to bully an Oklahoma sports writer he did not like. Westbrook has threatened TV personality Skip Bayless over the nickname Westbrook. When you seek an identity outside child of God, it makes you vulnerable to insecurity and easy to trigger. The rapper E-40 suffers the same problem. Gold chains, millions of dollars in fame do not strengthen a man's self-confidence and cool. On Saturday, E-40, a prominent Golden State Warriors fan, got escorted out of his seat by Sacramento King security because he beefed with a female fan who heckled him. Of course, E-40 said he was tossed because of racism. He said security assumed he was the instigator because he was arguing with a white woman. King security, this is quote from E-40, King security approached me, assumed I had instigated the encounter, and proceeded to kick me out of the arena, <clears throat> E-40 said in a written statement. He continued, unfortunately, it was just another reminder that despite my success and accolades as a musician and entrepreneur, racial bias remains prevalent. Security saw a disagreement between a black man and a white woman and immediately assumed that I was at fault. And I'm gonna give him that. I get, that is one possibility, that they walked up, said, oh, white, white woman, black man, black man must be <clears throat> in the wrong. That's a possibility. 
There's another potential explanation based on assumption as well. Perhaps Sacramento security saw a large black man who identifies as a commercial rapper. Perhaps that identity made security assume E-40 was at fault. Maybe they've heard E-40's 1993 classic, Captain save a hoe Maybe they assumed the rapper was burnishing his brand as a denigrator of women. E-40 claimed the fans were disrespectful in their taunts. Alleged disrespect is at the root of much of the animus and violence that transpires between black rappers. If a police officer had to guess who would turn violent in a disrespectful argument among fans, the officer would be justified in assuming it would be the rapper. Rappers flaunt their willingness to be violently disrespectful. More than likely, elite media will defend E-40. He's popular across social media, he's a celebrity, he's black, he has privilege. He's a multi-million dollar victim. All of this stems from men choosing the wrong identity. Men take pride in being conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, black, white, brown, gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, or whatever. All those surface level identities give men plenty of room to misbehave. None of those identities compel men to behave righteously. When you take your identity in God, you care very little about what man thinks about you. You don't get triggered by the taunts of fans. Russell Westbrook and E-40 are weak men. They think success in athletics and music grants them a special level of privilege and treatment. That's my fire. We're going to turn to uh, TJ Moe because he was a participant in Roll Call, did an awesome job at Roll Call, and he's a former uh, high-level athlete in the SEC playing football, cup of coffee in the, in, in the M NFL. TJ, uh, welcome to the show. And I, 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 let me see how I want to get you into this conversation. Do you like the way I use Russell Westbrook to promote what we were promoting at Roll Call? It's creative. It's well done. <laughs> and you could probably do that with virtually any topic in America today, which is why roll call was necessary. And that's the issue. Everybody's worried about their image and people are going to respect me. And, you know, everybody's going to I'm going to control their thoughts. If I don't like it, they're going to get a piece of my mind as if somehow Westbrook marching in there changed anything. All it did was cause us to talk about Confirm. how stupid he is. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I, I just think uh, it's, it is a tragedy how soft men have become. It really is. I mean, we see it on display. Westbrook shows up in a dress, you know, his little kilt that he comes in. It's a, it's a fashion show walking into the NBA. Should we surprise when they act like women at halftime? It, it, it's not funny. It's appropriate you go there because – you know, I started my speech out talking about how everything has been feminized because we've injected women into all spaces. And, and we now have to set up environments that accommodate the sensitivities and the emotions of women in all spaces. And I'm trying to point, it's unhealthy. And so Russell Westbrook can't even figure out why He's behaving and so easily triggered. And he thinks, you know, by running around, don't you call me names? Don't you call me names? And he's, you know, he ain't doing it that way. He's watch your mouth, mf -er, and all that other stuff and intimidating. Th th he doesn't understand how weak he looks because, again, we've turned night into day and yes into no. Everything's the opposite. And so he thinks that getting in someone's face and demanding that they respect me and you bet, because that, that fan, what he thinks about Russell Westbrook is of the utmost importance and must be corrected. And, and again, it's why I keep arguing, if you tell yourself every day, hey, I'm an NBA star, 
then you worry about fans. If you tell yourself every day, I'm a Christian, then you worry about God. And what man says about you has a lot less value. And, and, and when you hear people taunting and yelling stupid things, calling you out your name, it just doesn't trick you because you know, that ain't God, what do I care? And, and so I look at Westbrook and I look at E-40 and I look at all these celebrities that are detached from God and, and it explained the NBA is headquarters for this secular culture, this feminized culture. And I see athletes. I could have went on about Shannon Sharp and his courtside drama with Memphis Grizzlies players. I could have. There's all kinds of examples. Draymond Green kicking fans out of arenas for yelling the wrong thing. These guys have no idea that they're acting like women and they've been feminized. They think they're doing the most manly thing and they're doing the exact opposite. It's exactly right. And it's even, it's more dangerous that men are doing it because there are still pieces of us that are men. So the issue you run into is when women get offended and they're more emotional, every study ever done uh, demonstrates that, but women are not very confrontational and they're not very assertive. So they handle that by gossiping or they handle it by being passive aggressive, but men still handle it like men. We're still aggressive. So we get the worst of both worlds, right? It's good that men don't get offended that easily. And so our aggression can be aimed at the right place. It's good that women are not as aggressive so that when they get offended a little more easily, then well, at least they're not aggressive afterward. You're seeing Westbrook and these guys have the worst of both worlds. They're overly emotional and then and they want to punch you in the face. It's, it's such a destructive combination um, for guys like Westbrook, who, who so very clearly do not have a biblical worldview, uh, Paul talks all about it. Galatians 1.10 says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so as you walk around and you're trying to patrol everybody's thoughts, and so what's, what, I bet Jason's not thinking good thoughts about me today. I better go beat him over the head until he starts thinking good thoughts about me. Well, you're obviously not being a servant of God in that moment. When you turn your thoughts to yourself, as we talk about on the show all the time, talk about a roll call, then you start saying, oh, forget that guy. He's of no consequence to me. My behavior, on the other hand, needs to honor God because that's who I'm going to have to answer to. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians as well when he says, for I am nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. And so you're like, okay, God's looking at my actions. He'll deal with that guy over there. I don't have to deal with him, but I know I got to deal with what I'm about to do as I stomp into this lounge and take on a fan who's five foot three. Who, who actually called his bluff. None of it was a good look for Westbrook. None of it's a good look for the NBA. These things keep happening over and over and over again. Luckily for them, the NBA has the media in their hip pocket. We can see the change the, the, since the palace malice or malice in the palace in, in 2004, where there were some members of the media willing to call out like, hey man, I get the fans were stupid here, but these players are out of line. And David Stern was willing to back that up and, and do it. But things have totally reversed now. ESPN ran a story talking about uh, Russell Westbrook and how he bailed out the Clippers last night with his clutch play. There was a headline on ESPN.com. The guy shot three for 19, made a couple <laughs> of nice plays in the fourth quarter, but Kawhi Leonard carried that team. But, but they're trying to distract from the clear buffoonery of Russell Westbrook. They had it E-40. They, they love to attract all these rappers as fans and have them sit courtside. They love to have buffoons like Shannon Sharp sitting courtside. And, and, and they don't want people saying like, hey, what's going on at NBA games that there's all this constant conflict? And, and no one wants to deal with the environment and the culture that's been established within the NBA, within the basketball world, where this is always just a hair away from blowing up into something just like the palace malice or the malice in the palace. We're, 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 it's just, it's, it's so disappointing uh, that one, the media won't call them out. Two, that Adam Silver's too much of a coward to do anything about it. 
and, and three, that the players actually think this is appropriate behavior and this is a good look for them. I, I stood up to that fan. I went and confronted him. But you're on the road. This is what fans do. They yell stuff. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I it, mind blowing to me. I, 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 I TJ, before because we're going to talk about roll call in detail on Wednesday. I, I want to do a little mix of both because again, I want to be able to show you guys some videos. I think we got pictures and stuff of roll call that we'll show today. But I want to go a little bit into detail on Wednesday. But anyway, <clears throat> what was your favorite moment? <clears throat> Or what was your number one takeaway from our roll call event at Rocket Town uh, this weekend? Uh, that, that Russell Westbrook needs to be there, and so does much of the NBA. And they need to see what a man looks like. Uh, they could all learn a thing or two. You know, I, <clears throat> I probably shook hands with four or five hundred people and men who came from everywhere. We had one guy, Danny, came in from Hawaii. You know, we we had guys from everywhere. Daryl came in from California, right? We took, met guys from Pennsylvania and Florida and Virginia and Chicago and everywhere. These guys came from across the country. It was 800 something guys, and desperate to see men up on stage giving a clear vision and a biblical worldview, and to tell them that they're not crazy, because we're all feeling it. And it's just one guy after the next. Thanked me. Thanked Delano. Thanked Pastor Anthony, Pastor Bobby, you. Everybody that was there. Dave Shannon, Virgil. Everybody that was there walked it, one guy after the next. You, Dave Shannon wasn't even speaking. Couldn't walk across the room without somebody stopping him saying, thank you. Thank you for giving me something my kid can watch with me. This is my kid. He's 15. I brought him today because he needed to hear you speak. And so it's just, it, it for me, as a guy who... You know, we, we stand here and try to fight this fight every day, but right now we're recording in front of a camera, right? You don't see that sort of reaction every day. It was so encouraging to see men who desperately needed the product that we're giving them straight from the Bible. You know, it's, that's one thing that I told a lot of the guys. It's like, you think I got clarity? I was an idiot before I started reading this Bible. The Bible, all I'm doing, I sound pretty smart repeating God's word back to him. And so that's all these guys want. They just want some men to stand on the rock and say, look, here's my sword. It's called the Bible. If you want some clarity, there it is. And 800 plus guys were all about it. TJ, we'll we'll hopefully circle back for you tomorrow when we go in a little bit more in depth on roll call. Thank you for coming in for it. Thank you for doing a great job with your speech. Thank you for just being you. It was an awesome, uplifting event. I've heard from people from all over the country that are already back home and they're emailing me and t- giving me their thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I'm go- we, I want to talk to Dave because Dave was out in the crowd interviewing people the entire time. And so I'm going to have to ask Dave. I'm not going to ask you. I'll wait till Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to have to ask Dave uh, what he thought. I, I triggered a few people uh, when I said that uh, there will be no women at the next <laughs> roll call. Uh, I triggered a few people including people I paid to be there. Amazing. They get confused when I snap. All right, uh, my good friend Steve Dace's movie, Nefarious, is out. And I've been watching and hearing from people uh, over social media that have seen Nefarious. The reviews are rock solid. It's good. It supports our values. It's entertaining. It will have you on the edge of your seat. It's a great movie. It's not some, it's not, look, we, we know the deal with a lot of Christian content. Tends not to be that kind of entertaining, tends to be a little bit corny. That's not nefarious. Nefarious will have you on the edge of your seat. It'll have you a little bit spooked. It will be a bit of a mind twist, a mind game going on with you. And then boom, it's like, oh wow, it challenged me. It made me think about things differently. Uh, nefarious is a terrific movie. I suggest all of you go out and see it. I saw it several months ago, came out and told you. You guys know I'm very hard on movies. I fall asleep in most of them. I don't like most things I see. You listen to me critique everything, uh, everything but The Godfather pretty much. I like Nefarious. You should go see it. Uh, Go to whoisnefarious.com. Whoisnefarious.com. You can find out where it's playing. Go check it out. It's awesome. Go Shannon Chocolate Knox.
All right, welcome back. Uh, let's roll out to Idaho. Bring in Dave Shannon, a very tired father of seven who traveled all night to make it back home to his wife and kids uh, from our roll call event. Uh, Dave, uh, you were out in the crowd uh, for the entire day. You talked to the people. Uh, you were probably, you know, maybe held, held off some women who probably wanted to throw the heel of their shoe at me. Uh, for, for saying that uh, not everybody will be welcome at the next uh, roll call. Anyway, your, your thoughts and impressions, what, what did you hear from the crowd? What did you take away from our first ever roll call event? Yeah, uh, uh, man, there's so much. Let me start with what I think everybody else felt there. I think TJ hit it right on the nose. There were a lot of men that were surprised that other men were feeling the exact same way that they were feeling about the culture. Black, white, purple, green, and orange. They came there hoping and looking for some sort of strength with brothers. And I think they found it. As soon as even I started talking to guys even before the event started, the line was wrapped around the building. And men found other men who loved the Lord, who were have a concern for our nation and wanted to know that they weren't left alone. Um, and they found that out right there. I was impressed. You know, Jason, um, the army is bigger than what we think. And I go to a lot of conferences around a lot of Christian folks. But when I see that many men gather together who are all in, in one voice saying, hey, we want to see the work of God done here in our nation, starting with us. We're ready to take responsibility. That is powerful. Gideon only needed 300 men, and the event itself had close to 800. I was extremely encouraged about the future of our nation, and I don't think I was the only one. I think a lot of other men saw that impact and said, something is happening here, and as crazy as things look on the outside, whatever's happening here is going to have an impact on that environment that we're currently in right now. And I think a lot of men were encouraged by that. It, I, I'm going to be honest. Uh, the racial diversity of the crowd pleased me tremendously. I, I, I think 15% of the crowd was black and or Latino. I, I think... You know, that doesn't sound like an overwhelming number, but if you really uh, study and, and understand where the cross-section of people that came from New York, came from Florida, came from Montana, came from Arizona, from California, uh, from Portland, Oregon, Hawaii, and, and just it, it exceeded my vision and met my vision because I'm trying to get men to put away all these identities that divide us and just see ourselves as image bearers of Christ, ch children of God, Christians. And, and these men were willing to do that. I've heard from many people who have said they connected with people uh, who did not on the surface look like them and established relationships that I think will carry forward. That that's where I think we got to be. We, we got to put these other identities aside and, and just remember who we're really here to serve and obey and, and, and worship and feel grateful for. And, and to see that many men make that effort. Look, we did this in three months, I believe. And yeah. normally these events are six to eight month processes. The second one will be bigger and better. Uh, Tony Dungy has told me he will participate as long as we match it up with his schedule. Uh, I, I just think bigger and better things are yet to come. Yeah, Jason, the thing that struck me too, I, I was really impressed. I think there was more than you think as far as 15%. I think there was maybe at least a third or, or more of, of brothers that were there, black men that were there. But that wasn't the thing that struck me necessarily. The diversity is what struck me. And when I mean diversity, I mean across financial platforms, cross cultural platforms and where people are living at and kind of work that they do, blue collar, white collar. It was a mixed bag all the way around. It wasn't just a mixed bag in the racial side. Because the truth is, is we can have one full 
racial group there, but the diversity and the culture from where these people come from can be pretty broad. But we just didn't have that. It was across all the lines. It was extremely diverse. Um, the kind of man you saw older, much older men that were there who were looking to mentor younger men and those younger men hungry to find a mentor. That was something else that was in, it really uh, impressive was that there was younger guys there looking for men who had experienced life, who knew what to do next and were trying to find um, a, a, a somebody who they can model themselves after. And so I think there has been the fatherlessness and the father hunger that has permeated the culture. I think unfortunately a lot of evangelical conferences and and evangelical mans and pastors have forgotten about a group of a large segment of group of men that are kind of the evangelical center that don't have fathers and what i saw was a group of men coming together saying i got your back i'm gonna link up with you it's like the roman shields were linking up together to say we're stronger together we going to hold together. We're going to bind together. We're going to do something together. And it was men ready to be poured into and men ready to pour into other men. And it was, I had a friend of mine who came who's in real estate. He's doing really well. He met another man who's not his race into real estate. He's like, I connected with him. We hung out all day together. And so there's a bond that is transcending cultural backgrounds, racial backgrounds, because of their care and love for the Lord. And that's one thing that was really impressive to see. And everybody kept saying this same thing. Before the conference was done, halfway through the conference, the people I were talking to was like, this is more than I expected. This is better than what I expected. This is giving me everything that I needed, everything I wanted, because there isn't a place for men to come together to be discipled. There just isn't a place for it. And Roll Call is making that spot available for men to get whatever they were lacking from not having bigger brothers and father hunger. I... I I'm not going to give all the background of what was going on that uh, triggered isn't the right word, but made me get a little more real and raw than perhaps I, I planned on it because I did not plan on that. But, but uh, you know, at one point I just clarified because I was feeling it is true. Just we need spaces where men can get together and have conversations about real stuff without worrying about people's sensitivities and emotions and all that. And so I, I, I thought I was crystal clear that like, hey, look, you married guys, brought your wives. I'm good. I, I understand you were made one with that through your marriage covenant. I get it. But moving forward, now that everybody knows this isn't an excuse to hit the strip clubs or do anything crazy, uh, I need the wives to let their husbands come do this on their own, come to the city. I, I don't need you at roll call. And then I thought, and I'm, I'm not going to apologize for it. I know people are frustrated by it, but uh, the women that came unescorted, I thought were out of line, and I said so. And I know it bothered some people. Uh, it, <laughs> it even bothered people that I had paid to be there. And, and they missing, like, is he talking to me? And I'm like, <laughs> I invited you. We paid you to be here. Uh, some of you, we even advertised you would be here. <laughs> How could I be talking to you? But I, I just do think it's, they, they've destroyed all spaces for men under the premise of diversity and inclusion. And, and we don't understand that that destruction has ramifications. It has created a lot of the dishonest, oh, let me worry about feelings and not say what I really think, conversations that prevent us from getting at the heart of matters. Um, I was telling my wife about that. And one of the things that she was questioning and one of the things that I told her, I was like, babe, let me tell you something about guys. We one way when we together and you start putting women there and a pretty woman at that and everything changes around us. We will move completely different because we see her. and We be like, I wonder how she thinks about me. Right. <laughs> and as soon as you get an environment like that, all of a sudden, everybody is going to operate differently. And so. 
I am for absolutely having a place where men can absolutely have conversation. There's some conversations I'm going to tell you. I don't want my wife to be around that men are having. I'm just going to tell you straight up. It's, I don't want her to be around. There's some things I need to say to men that I don't need her to hear. You know, there's some things that they need to to hear without me having to be soft because there's another woman around. And so I don't want to be disrespectful to another man while his wife is there. So there's all sorts of different things that happen that are important for men to have a space to talk very freely, especially when we're dealing with so many things as men right now. We we need that space. So the only thing that I want to say just that we probably need to consider is what would it look like then for an event where it is more family oriented? I think that Looking at what Fearless in the roll call is doing for men, I'm thinking, man, what does it look like to speak like this into families too, right? And so I think there's a place for that, you know. Once That's we get the man a thousand all lined percent up, going to happen. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, we're going to have roll call. At some point, we'll come up with a name for our fathers and families event. Uh, and maybe it's no more clever than fathers and families. I don't know. I'll come up with, we'll come up with a name at some point, but we will have events that will be appropriate for the entire family. I just need, we have such a crisis going on with men. Facts. And men feel so unsupported. And that's the energy I thought we were feeling in that entire crowd and the feedback I was getting is like, Oh, my God, somebody thinks like me and is willing to say it out loud on a microphone and I can look around and say, oh, man, all these guys agree with me. I'm going to I'll give you the example. TJ shared this with me when I was telling and I've I've told the story here before on on the show. But, you know, I I told it a little differently, a little more forcefully when I was telling the story about Breonna Taylor and how that boyfriend let her walk to the front door with him. Uh, one of the security guys was, was applauding and pointing and nodding his head. And, and again, you can't say that anywhere because the culture has been tr- triggered and rigged up in a way where, you know, only the police can get blamed. No one can talk about the failure of that half a man that allowed his woman to walk straight into trouble. I have no respect for that. And men need to be called out for that so that we're thinking differently. We don't want any other man to make that mistake. If there's trouble at your door and your woman is laying in bed with you someplace safe, leave her there and go figure out what the trouble is. That's your That's job right. as a man. And don't, we going to do this together, we Bonnie and Clyde. No. That's some ignorant stuff that got his woman killed and 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 we need to pass that advice along and say that out loud so that it doesn't happen to another woman. And it doesn't, because trust, no matter what this man says in public, he knows what happened. He fired the first shot. He let his woman walk up there right into trouble with him. He, he know he's dealing with all that, but the rest of the culture needs to hear that. And Dave, I, I just thank you so much. Going to try to circle back to you if you're available on Wednesday to participate in tennis because yes. we're going to have a little deeper discussion on this. But, man, really appreciate you traveling in. I know it was a nightmare getting home. Uh, tell your wife I'm sorry. Give your kids a peck on the cheek for me. Love you. God bless you, brother. All right. Uh, are you hitting those likes? Are you hitting the subscribe button? Are you getting the notifications? Are you on Apple hitting that five-star review? Uh, We're going to lighten up the conversation when we come back. Steve Kim is going to join us. We'll circle back, talk a little Russell Westbrook. We'll talk some Jalen Hurts. Philadelphia Eagles quarterback is now the uh, richest man in football. Steve Kim, Korean Cosell. All right, welcome back. Time for some Korean Cosell. And we'll circle back to Russell Westbrook before getting into the big NFL news with Jalen Hurts. Steve, it feels like to me, once every two weeks, there's some sort of incident between an NBA player 
in a courtside or courtside with a fan, whether courtside or there's some sort of incident. It, it feels like that's probably not accurate that it's every two weeks, but it is. It does seem commonplace. And Russell Westbrook just had another one. And it feels like to me with this pattern that the media is trying to ignore, particularly ESPN, we're going to have a second malice at the palace. Am I wrong for thinking that? All right. Well, first of all, Jason, good Monday to you. And to be fair, because this is what we do here. If you take away the incidents involving Russell Westbrook, it only seems like once every <laughs> month. So let, let's put that in the context. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. Um, I long for the days of the malice in the palace. I, I mean, I even long for the days of Mad Max going into the crowd in Portland because someone actually said something about his daughter. Because at least it was authentic. At least it was like real emotion. Here, this is just a tantrum. And to be fair, a large amount of these involve one player who's very petulant. And Jason, can I just make a personal observation? I think anyone above the age of 25 to 30, if you have the words or the adjective petulant associated with you, that's not a great look. And I, I don't understand why the visiting crowds just don't absolutely team up on him and start chanting like they do in college games, like West Brick. I mean, what's he going to do? Get the whole lower bowl thrown out? And one of these days, Russell's going to run into the wrong guy that really gives none. And this guy might be a Navy SEAL, maybe a guy that trains in MMA, who may not even like basketball. But there's an old saying in consumerism or in business, the customer is always right. In the NBA, if the customer happens to be a white person, and they are about 98% of that audience, they're always wrong. So in a way, Russell knows there's never going to be any accountability on his end because no one's really going to strike back because they don't want the blowback on social media. And this is the point that you uh, wrote in your column today. Adam Silver has allowed this. He has fostered this. And now this is what he gets. Adam Silver reminds me of that player's coach. And it, it reminds me of Larry Coker, not just because of the bald head. Larry Coker took over an unbelievable team in 2001. Five years later, he got fired because we're in the MPC Bowl, Miami, playing Nevada on a blue field. Right now, to me, the NBA is the MPC Blue Bowl game on a blue field. It's sad what has happened to this once great product. You just took me to a, a very interesting point. The NBA is the wokest of the woke sports leagues. By far. And so if it, if their woke league with all their black celebrity superstars sitting courtside, if they're having the most conflict within their woke culture and identity culture, this place should be the epitome of racial harmony yeah. if woke culture was right, but it's actually the antithesis of it. And now, my God, I wish I had written that in my mono because that, I may circle back to this again tomorrow and write about it tomorrow because th this is the epitome of sports inclusion and lovey-dovey and utopia, but there's constant conflict. That contradiction should be eye-opening to a lot of people about what the real agenda is with the woke. You know, I remember when I was a huge, hardcore NBA basketball fan, just like you were in the 80s, and they had this tagline. They used to play it in between the commercials. NBA action, it's fantastic. And they had different commercials. They had all those highlight vignettes. And it always seemed like that there was this great harmony between the fans who are as close to any athlete of any professional sport. They sit literally courtside. And the players, there was this synergy. Like, hey, we're all in this together. We love this game. And celebrity fans, and we'll get to that later, Jack Nicholson would play along. And they had fun with it. And then even the guys that heckled people, like Robin Ficker, famous a DC attorney, <laughs> even the players thought it was an honor to have him in their ear the whole game. And now it's almost become just this den of animosity. And I'll say it again. I don't know why, as a consumer, you would choose to be uh, spending your hard-earned money, and those courtside seats are not inexpensive, just to not be able to have some fun, express yourself, 
and then to be berated by a player who simply cannot take everyday heckling. I, I'm Look, I am one of these fans. I don't believe in getting in people's faces. I really don't even talk to other people. Or just riding a player to a degree where it gets very personal. That's just not who I am. But you know what? There is a line that many fans do not cross. But now a player like Russell Westbrook seems to be crossing that line on his own. I mean, literally, when you showed me that first clip, I was like, wait a minute. Did this guy come into some guy's living room? I had no idea that he actually went into a <laughs> box. That is unheard of. It's So, what... My other thought is the NBA loves to celebrate the rappers that attend the games. Mm. And, and so I, I would love to ask Adam Silver, and, and I, you know what, I may try to make it a point to maybe go to the NBA Finals because the commissioner does press conferences. None of these media people will ask this question. But it should be an obvious, I mean, it really should be an obvious one. Given the violent, consistent violent death of rappers getting shot. I mean, we, could, we would be here all day trying to list all the rappers that have been shot and killed, high profile ones. Why are you celebrating that the rappers are courtside at your arenas? Is that the audience, the environment that you want sitting courtside? I'm looking at E-40. I've always liked E-40. He's friends with uh, Tech Nine and has been on a lot of Tech Nine music over the years. There was a connection between Kansas City rap and Bay Area rap years ago. Still, still is. But, but I'm looking at him scream and yell and appear to me, call that woman the B word and threaten and all that other stuff. And Adam Silver and people running the NBA can't look at that and go, huh. I bet you that's the kind of attitude and behavior that Young Dolph used to exhibit before he got shot, or Nipsey Hussle before he got shot, or Tupac Shakur before he got shot. And, and you know what? Let's keep dropping these guys and their entourages into our arena until someone really gets hurt. It's a real possibility. I, I, I would step away from leaning into the fact that every gold chain wearing rapper sits courtside at my arena. Jason, E-40, or you know, I don't know his real name, but I'll just call him that, E-40. He has to realize one thing. No matter how much fame you have, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much affluence you have attained, you are still a fan. And you, when you go into a hostile environment of a road team or a road venue, okay, and what is a kind of a one-sided rivalry, and I guess the Sacramento Kings haven't made the playoffs since, what, the last days of Vladdy Divac or Chris Webber, it's going to get heated, and he's made the mistake of thinking, I'm E-40, and I get to be treated special. Going back to Jack Nicholson, I remember him when he'd go into the Garden in the 80s. He used to get heckled all the time, and he rolled with the punches. He thought it was funny. In fact, some of the banners were actually focused not on Magic or Kareem or Worthy, but on Jack Nicholson, and Jack used to mock it and have fun. Let's go back to another famous fan from another era, Spike Lee. Spike Lee, the number one or at least most famous Nick fan, used to get into it with fellow players, especially the Pacers. And I'm sure he heard it ringside from a lot of people uh, in Indianapolis, specifically in that one series, I believe, in 94 or 95. And, but it was kind of friendly. It was a little bit more like, hey, it's all part of the game. It's all part of the character that we're going to drive within this league. But now it's a little bit different. And it seems a lot more um, anger-fueled to be honest with you, but Adam Silver has never had the guts to actually say, wait a minute, hold on, let the adults be in charge here. Say what you want about David Stern. And a lot of people can say that he was draconian, that he was a dictator. And you know what? To that I say, good. It was needed. As I look at these players walk into the locker room, dressed the way they were, and I'm not going to lie to you, Jason, back in the mid to late 90s, when he put together that dress code as a younger Kim, I said, I hate this. Let them dress the way they want. This is awful. He has no right now. The older Kimster is like, oh, my God, can we get back to Michael Jordan in his baggy suits? You know, the double breasted stuff. I mean, God, it's just I'm old. I'm Are you not telling on yourself were, were you woke at some point? No, no, no. You were, I was were you woke? Oh, no, I was young and much more liberal. 
but now I have evolved and I have changed. Anyone that is the same at 25, um, or the same at 50 as they were at 25, you know what they say? You've wasted 25 years of your life. Luckily, I have not wasted 25 years of my life. I've squandered a few, but I haven't wasted all 25. But again, you're right. I am old. but And I've always said this to people that say, well, Steve, you're from a different era. Right. The great thing about me is very simple. I'm not changing. You can disagree all you want. When you look at those NBA players walk into that locker room, this is where I give Charles Barkley credit. The stuff he says under his breath on TNT Jason, be honest. Don't you think a large majority of the country actually agrees with Sir Charles? Well, of course. Everybody does. It, it, it. Look, man, I'm from fans heckling. Just remember the great college environments, the oh. Mizzou antlers and, you know, the, the student bodies and the way they would change. That was all great. That was all part of the atmosphere. Oh, man, the Antlers are going, what creative thing are they going to do to taunt the other team? And everybody was good with it. Now we've turned everything, anything said, particularly by a white fan, or and I think this guy that Russell Westbrook, I think he was Latino uh, or Latinx or whatever they call it. Uh, no, they didn't, <laughs> now. Well, they didn't but, call themselves but, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they call it. But I'm from the environment where we look forward to that, a rowdy crowd and student body, and now it's all off limits, and all of it has this underlying racial component to it. Jason, the Cameron crazies are now basically censored. They used to be some of the fun. I remember the year they played UNLV, the first year they got blown out is in Denver, the 38-point or 35-point victory for Tarkanian. Um... During that situation, the, the Duke section had this banner directed to UNLV, welcome fellow scholars. And it was funny. No one made a big deal out of it. And there was, all, there was also a player, I think it was Chris Washburn, one of the all-time great draft busts, prodigious talent, but just did not have the, the mental wherewithal to just hold it together. I think it was either him or another player ended up stealing a pizza. Something happened, some theft of a delivery pizza. So the next road game that NC State or wherever they played, when they introduced Washburn, the whole student session all threw pizza boxes onto the floor. I mean, it's hilarious. So if, if I'm now one of these teams playing you're, the You're Clippers, missing the greatest thing, Kim, that's right up your alley. I can't believe you haven't played this card. It's, it's right up your alley. The greatest taunting fan deal, I think, in college sports history. Catholic Catholics versus, versus convicts. Yes. Right. And you couldn't, couldn't do, do that. Couldn't do it now. Today. Right. And even then, the guy that made the shirt lost his spot on the basketball roster as a preferred walk-on, which is a great honor. So there was even a price to pay back then. But if I'm a, an opponent now, the Clippers moving forward, you always have these bootleg guys that sell, like, the T-shirts that aren't licensed. You know, instead of buying a $38 overpriced T-shirt, you can get the exact same one. It's going to fade after a couple washings for about 20 You know, so whatever. I would make styrofoam bricks, and I'd call them the Russell West bricks. I would. <laughs> and just have to it. Remember Vic the Brick Jacobs, L.A. legend? He was a sportscaster, and whoever made the dumbest play or did the dumbest thing, he said, this brick is for you, and he'd throw it at the screen, and it would shatter. I would make a bunch of those styrofoam bricks, just like I would number one foam fingers. I mean, what is Westbrook going to do? Get every single person in that arena kicked out that has a brick? I don't see it. Uh, let's move to the NFL. Jalen Hurts now in mm. some sort of way, is the highest paid player uh, in NFL history at $51 million a year on average on the books. Uh, what they're leaning into and what we're going to have jammed down our throat is that Nicole Lynn, his agent, black woman, she's negotiated the richest contract in NFL history. She's the Viola Davis of... <laughs> of uh, <laughs> NFL agents and Lamar Jackson's mama's own deck to be next uh, is, let's start with an easier one. Jalen Hurts, overpaid, yes or no? Uh, I believe in a couple of years this contract will be very interesting. I read a little bit about it. A lot of it's front-loaded. 
and much of the money, if not, is all guaranteed, but a large majority will be in his bank account within two or three years. I look at it differently. I, I think this is a terrible day for ESPN pundits that have been riding the Lamar Jackson train, namely Robert Griffin, Ryan Clark, that whole crew, that they wanted to use the racial element that a black quarterback cannot get ahead, regardless of the facts some of the highest paid players uh, in the league are precisely that. And now you have a guy, and I will give this agent credit. She actually knew the system. She knew the marketplace, and she was smart. Uh, Lamar Jackson, I don't know if he's come off of this, but he kept insisting on, I need the exact same template as Deshaun Watson. I need 100% of that salary guaranteed. But this crew here said, you know what? Hold on. We know our style of play. We understand our economic value. Let's get most of our money, but let's be reasonable. So again, I, I am not a capologist. I'm not Sal Palantonio or Adam Schefter. I don't know what this is going to do to the salary cap of the Philadelphia Eagles in three years, but I love the fact that this looks like a deal that works for both sides. And, and look, say what you want. As of right now, Jason, I think it's really interesting. You haven't heard anything on the Lamar Jackson front for at least three weeks. The market has spoken. Has. Uh, I do think now, I think Lamar's mom and Lamar are going to pivot to focus on this contract and, right. and say, we want this contract. But I, I want to take you in a bit of a different area. I hate to move you outside of your base of information, and, and I'm veering into my base of information as it relates to Nicole Lynn. Uh, I see her, the agent, as a front-facing publicity stunt that's playing to the matriarchal culture that's being promoted by the media. I think she's been installed as the woman king of, of sports media or sports agency, and that others actually have done the work. And that's gonna get, that's gonna irritate people, and Jason's just a hater, and he's always down, but I've been tracking this for a solid three years. Uh, I know someone who knows this situation intimately, has been walking me through, even before Jalen Hurts, what this woman's been doing and how she's being used and manipulated. And, and so they're going to ESPN and all the media is going to lean into the woman king agent and we're going to hear it everywhere. And, and Lamar Jackson and every other NFL player is going, man, I need that hot girl, Nicole Lynn. She's a sister. She's my woman king. I need her representing me. Hats off to the agency and everybody that put this plan together. Hats off to it because I do think it's a brilliant plan. Will it work over the long haul? I'm not sure that agents are very competitive. I, I, she'll be tough to wrestle with, fight with, uh, leak information on because whoever reports anything negative about her will be called racist. But this contract will be analyzed by all of her competitors because they know this is a larger play of They've installed the Instagram, you know, she's Malika and she's the Malika Andrews of sports agents. And they're hoping that all the other or many black NFL players like, yeah, I want to be represented by her. That smoking hot NFL okay. agent. I, I think that's what the play is here. Right. I, I, I hate to drag you into my narrative, uh, but anyway, you have any thoughts on that? I mean, look, it, it, you want to be represented by her and get that type of contract? Oh, I have one question for all these prospective players. Are you an MVP? Uh, it kind of reminds me of boxing. I see this a lot. And unlike her, where she did start with the rookie deal, that's from the very beginning, the genesis of the pro career with Jalen Hurts. So you got to give her that. But I see this in boxing all the time where a fighter gets like 35, 40, 45 fights, one of the best fighters in the world, three-time world champion. And they ditched the manager that started them, that got all the four-round fights, developed them, made the deals with the promoters, guided them, kept them away from certain fights. Then all of a sudden, to save money, they installed a wife. And everyone says, boy, that wife really knows boxing. And I'm like, until a wife begins a their husband's career at zero and zero, 
I don't give them the same credit as I would the regular managers. That's just the truth because it's a much different job. Jason, if you and I were allowed to take over fighters at 35 and 0 and three world champions, trust me, we would also look like Doc Kearns. Okay. Um, the one part of this story that I found a little bit strange, and in the immortal words of Arsenio Hall, it made me go, hmm, that before the draft, as Jalen Hurts is going into the National Football League, she slides into his DMs like Drake. And she just said, hey, do you have an agent? Let's link. Oh, huh. I, I guess that's the way Lee Steinberg and uh, Tom Condon have done it. Huh? I, I just, you're, you're right. There's something about it. Like, wait, it was really just, let's link. There was no presentation. There's no track record. You didn't really meet with them. You had never represented anyone before. But your whole sales pitch is, let's link. Okay. Okay, but again, and I'll say this again, when you have the NFL reigning MVP, it's a lot easier to get a lucrative contract than it is that journeyman guard trying to get his third contract. It's different. She started with Quinnen Williams, uh, defensive tackle. That was her first big get in 2019. There's, okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going I'm to I'm do this. I'm going to say it. Mo he was purchased. Uh, by the, I, I think that was, I, she may have started with Birdman and, and, and some rappers originally. And then Clutch Sports saw the play and they acquired Nicole Lynn. Uh, and so, again, she's a University of Oklahoma graduate. Obviously, Jalen Hurst played his last year at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, but, She's just 34 years old. This sounds like, hey, it, it's not, I'm just facting so that you have information. You can reach your own conclusions. I'm just telling you facts and information. Reach your own conclusions. I'm not pointing you a particular direction, but attractive woman, young. Uh, her first big get was the purchase of Quinn and Williams, and, and now the Jalen Hurts deal, and now she's the Wonder King, and she's the smartest agent in the history of the NFL. She signed the richest contract. Uh, Viola Davis is going to play her in a movie probably next week, and uh, she's 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 Michael Jordan's mama. She put this all together. She's going to blow up the the whole. She's Stacey Abrams, is what I'm telling you. But she's a hot oh, Stacey uh, Abrams. No, uh, yeah, okay. Jeez, <laughs> I mean, come on. So I will say I'm this just, for her: she's accomplished yeah. more than Stacey Abrams ever has. I will give her that. What has Stacey Abrams There's, ever? I mean, Stacey Abrams is known. I agree. For, she's accomplished something that's more than Stacey Abrams. Yes. Right. Stacey love, Abrams couldn't balance her checkbook until. They right. <laughs> until they I mean, until they her purchased her for the Democratic Party is losing an election in Georgia. She's already done more. But again, do I think that she's like this disruptor to a point where all these people are going to fly again? I'll go back to boxing. There, there have been like celebrity managers like MC Hammer. I brought him up a couple weeks ago and, you know, they make a splash. Everyone gets uh, really excited back, back in boxing it's really interesting you always have like every five years a new company whether it was rock nation or some other companies that say that we're going to be the new promoter we're going to disrupt this game we're going to change the paradigm and then three years later they figure out oh my god this boxing thing's kind of tough it's one of my favorite lines from the great bob arum he was asked about this in the 80s what do you think about these new promoters they're going to change the sport and bob arum says as only he could look you gotta understand the desert is strewn with bleached bones. In other words, all these people come in with great hoopla, and then they're dead two years later. So let's see what the track record is of this young lady. Let's see in three, four years what her clientele looks like. Uh, trust me, there's a group of people that control, and you don't, don't you respond to this. I'm going to move on to something else. Don't <laughs> respond. I don't want to get you into my trouble. There's a group uh -oh. of people that control the agency world who are going to circle the wagons and make sure that the road is hard for uh, Nicole Lynn. I'll just leave it. You fill okay. in the blanks yourself there uh, <laughs> in the audience. That's as far as I want to go with it today. Uh, 
Kawhi Leonard drops 38, pulls off an upset of the Phoenix Suns. If somehow they win this series, playoff Kawhi, not not playoff P, uh, playoff Paul George, who set out last night. This was a reminder last night of the Clippers pulling this off, and if somehow they figure out a way to win this series without playoff P and with Russell Westbrook shooting three of 19 from the field, it's going to be – more, it's going to help strengthen Kawhi Leonard's legacy because I think his legacy is in tatters at this point, but he could, you know, put together an argument, hey, he's one of the great playoff performers ever if somehow they have a nice long playoff run. Do you think the often injured, often load managing uh, Kawhi Leonard can salvage his reputation with a, a, a playoff run here with the Clippers? Well, I have a question. Is he going to play in games two and three? I mean, he exerted a lot of energy there yesterday. I mean, <laughs> see him in game four. I, look, everyone's talking about how the Lakers are dangerous. And look, with a healthy AD, which is always tenuous, and LeBron James and some younger legs around him, that team looks like they're going to be a tough out, whether you love them or hate them. The one team I don't think they want to face is the Clippers. And if Paul George can return to action – that's going to be one of the more interesting series before the NBA Finals I think we've ever seen. Um, certainly the city of Los Angeles would care about it. But, yes, with Kawhi 5-0, he can, he can go out there and rewrite his history. Because let's be honest, post-San Antonio, it's been a bit of a bust. He's never out there. He hasn't no, the no, Clippers. post-Toronto. 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 You're right you about that. won a championship. You're, you yeah. are right about that. So – up until that point, he was known as this gifted player who was a little bit abnormal in terms of his personality and his persona. He was a hired gun in Toronto, and I think they won it in, what, 2019, right, against a banged-up Golden State Warrior squad. But think about that. I forgot about it, and I think a lot of other people have, too. Then he was supposed to be the conquering hero who turned down the Lakers uh, because he's kind of an iconoclastic personality. He said, you know what, I'm going to go with Balmer. I'm going to take his millions and billions of dollars. And it's almost like he hasn't been seen as a clipper. He Look, he has been brought in for one reason. Bring the Clippers to at least a Western Conference Finals, which they've never done before. I think people have to realize how little that they have in terms of their resume in the postseason. So, yes, if he can do this and lead them to an NBA Finals at the very least, now you're thinking if you're a bomber, you know what, that investment has been worth it. Finally, uh, the Lakers won game one, and Ja Morant is now injured and questionable. But hmm. to me, what's fascinating about the Lakers that, that I need someone to unpack, and I know you're not ready to unpack it, but I'm fascinated by this white kid, Austin Reeves, who, who's, who's starting to look like the Lakers' most reliable and First, second best player. I mean, AD's not reliable. Uh, LeBron is old, and, you know, he puts up st- stats and numbers, but I can't bl- – this guy spent five years in college basketball. Five. He did a redshirt year or set out a year because of transfer. He did five years in college. The guy's like 24 years old in his second NBA season and looks like he may be a real player. Do, if, do you think – and I know you're no expert, but do you see a path for the Lakers to perhaps come out of the West? Well, first of all, come on. I I know you're not a LeBron guy. He is still the straw that stirs the drink. Come on. It's still LeBron. I know that Austin Reeves for one day is him, but he's a very talented role player. This is still about LeBron. And without a healthy AD, they're not going to go anywhere. And is there a path? Yes, because the NBA needs LeBron. Let's just be very honest about it. I'm not trying to be all over stone here, but you know what they're trying to set up. They want at least one or two series with LeBron James and his cast of characters and whoever comes out of the East. But the Lakers are a real threat as long as they are healthy. But come on, Jason. Austin Reeves is a very good contributor. That team is about one guy, LeBron James. That has not changed. Come on, Jason. I even that's still true. But Austin Reeves is fascinating. 
it's fair. Because I'm telling you, I knew nothing about him. And I, but when LeBron was down and injured, the kid came in and played well, and now he's playing well in the postseason. <laughs> kind of fascinating. Uh, Steve, f- finally, uh, we missed you at roll call, but we had a <laughs> lot of people ask about the Korean Cosell oh, at roll call. Nice. Uh, they want me to fly a hot tub out to uh, California and baptize you personally. Uh, so that may be roll call, too, that – we come out and baptize you and Coach JB at the same time. Oh, okay. I don't think that's going to happen. By the way, I was with JB watching uh, some games and some YouTube highlights of, uh, you know, Barry Sanders. Had a good time. His barbecue skills were unbelievable. His ribs were incredible. And then he made, like, pulled pork sandwiches. Oh, God, great time. Although the NBA games, I didn't really watch that much of them. But, you know, we had this discussion. Um, We had three television screens in his uh, bar area. And – his disrespect of Ray Lewis is just – I almost walked out, but I said, what? you're lucky. You suck. Oh, yeah, he says Ray Lewis is overrated. He actually said, like, London Fletcher what? and Bullock were better linebackers than Raymond Anthony Lewis. I almost threw up all the food that I had. Um, and, and then he said, like, Emmett Smith wasn't – he was just pissing me off for, like, a couple hours. He had a good time, though. He had a good time, though. But his ribs, but his ribs. But his ribs and his pulled pork more than made up for his football. Opinion. He may have to come on tomorrow and defend that Ray Lewis position. I think you might hang that's, up on him, though. That's the problem. You're going to hang up on him. You're just going to hang right I do. Up. There, there's certain NFL players that can trigger me. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't, you remember the year I snapped when Willie Rofe didn't make the NFL Hall of Fame on the first ballot? Do, do yeah. you remember that for any reason? I do. I, I went after Peter King and every, uh, what's the guy from Dallas? Uh, John, or I can't, I can't remember. Old dude in Dallas wears glasses. I snapped on them all about Willie Rove not making it on the first breath. And, and I can snap like that about Ray Lewis. Yeah, the, the, give it to the, him. You know, Ray Lewis is one of the five greatest defensive players of all time. Okay. And I, I joke with Ray about London Fletcher, not to denigrate London Fletcher, but that's like a running joke I have. So anyway, I may bring uh, JB on to scold him about that. Uh, <laughs> Tamara came to roll call and she asked about you, Steve. She sung Freedom for Everybody and she asked about you. You know, she works at Wally's in Beverly Hills. She was like, oh, I thought I'd get to meet Steve Kim inviting down to uh, Wally's in, in Beverly Hills. Well, I'll tell you what. If she sends me an invite, I'll be at Wally's this week. And set me up a little table, <laughs> have a little bit of salad, and I'll have a BLT out there. And I'll even take your old seat. You know, in fact, I'll leave your seat empty in honor of you. Because if there's ever been a yeah. bib that should be retired on the wall of Wally's, you know, like the monuments <laughs> at Yankee Stadium, you know, Gary yeah. Groot, it should be like Whitlock right there with your fork. You know, that would be great. Tell her I'll be down at Wally's. Don't Give me send day. me the bill. <laughs> oh, yeah, wait, don't wait, send forget. me the bill, though. Yeah, it, You're on your own. You and JB yeah. got it. All right, thank okay. you, Steve. Great job. Don't play tomorrow just yet. <clears throat> I want to – we're going to continue to talk about roll call this week. We'll d- dive into it a little in detail on Wednesday. I do want to just try to uh, convey my heartfelt gratitude and thanks uh, to my team here with Fearless. These guys and girls were amazing. Uh, Tiffany uh, Oldham, our MVP, without question, worked tirelessly uh, to put this thing together and make sure everybody was comfortable. Uh, the guys that work with me here in studio, Christian Newland, Ren Blake, David Reed, these guys, incredible. Ren didn't do a lot but watch and cry, uh, but he was there in spirit. Uh, David Reed and Christian worked. Kenny, Kenny worked so hard, he just, he, he just didn't come to work today. Uh, who, who, who know? I'll get to the bottom of that, but uh, man. Did these guys uh, make it easy on me? It was a hard weekend for all of us, starting you know Friday night with all those people here in studio. They come back, they were there, and we got another group in studio with us Saturday morning. These guys are all working at the uh, venue at Rocket Town, and <clears throat> so many people that I'll probably spend all week thanking people, but uh, from Pastor Anthony or Anthony Walker, I'm sorry, Anthony to Bobby Harrington, to Delano, to TJ Moe. Speeches were absolutely magnificent. The the crowd loved them. Everybody was fired up and did a great job. Uh, 
you know, our sponsor, Daryl Carter, came in on Friday and uh, spent a lot of time with us Friday and Saturday, he took us out to dinner Saturday. I want to thank Daryl Carter. I want to thank Chris Talley and the guys at Logo Brands. Awesome gift bags. People were pleased with them. The, the custom uh, merchandise that, th that they gave to our visitors, uh, to the people that came to our Friday and Saturday special events. Awesome. Uh, The people that came from Maritza and uh, Gaston Mooney came in from Dallas and assisted Gaston. Obviously, uh, our president here at The Blaze was there. Uh, David Meir did our merchandise for us, was here. Um, some volunteers from Bobby's Harpeth Church, uh, volunteers just from around here in Nashville. Our, our potential other co-MVP alongside Tiffany would be Virgil Walker. You guys see Virgil with us on most uh, Wednesdays. He'll be here on this Wednesday to talk. Virgil, just an unbelievable job. If I didn't say it, I'm telling you by the end of the week, I'll be thanking others. But most of everybody, I want to thank you guys that came out. The, the, trust me, this event's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you guys will be able to say, I was on the ground floor and helped start this and support this day one. You will always be what we call our day ones. You'll be our day ones. I won't tell you what the other word they say on the other side of that, but you're, you're our day one soldiers. And thank you so much. Thanks for putting up with me. I, we'll, we'll eventually play some video and we'll try to find some where, where I wasn't crying. Uh, that will be difficult to find. Uh, it was an awesome event, and I love y'all. I, th I thank you so much uh, for supporting me, the vision of this show. Oh, my God, thank you. TJ just <laughs> remind Bryson Gray, love you, man. Awesome performance. Uh, Allie Taylor and Tamara Conrad, love you guys. Awesome performance. Tay Lewis, Davina, these guys came in and sang Harmony. Uh, Tamara sang Freedom. Uh, TJ requested that Bryson sing the Homemaker song. I, I was like, we, we want to sing Homemaker? It's a bunch of dudes. The dudes loved it. <laughs> the du you you want to see some uh, 35 to 60 year old uh, goofy men bobbing their heads to some rapper? You got to see the video of what went down at Roll Call with Bryson Gray on the stage. Bryson is an incredible performer. All he had was a mic and some music. He had his buddy reading Bible verses at, at, at the beginning of it. And Bryson comes out and challenges everybody and then starts doing his rap. Incredible performance. It really got the crowd fired up. Uh, I'll end for those of you that were there. Oh, I'll end with this. There was three pieces of advice that I'll be talking about that we'll be leaning into for uh, the rest of, until our next roll call. Very simple things that I asked attendees to do, and I want you guys to do it at home as well as we try to tune our minds and hearts to the right frequency so that we can hear from God and so that he can guide and direct us. Very simple things. I'm talking about basic training. I didn't ask anybody to do anything hard. This is what we're committed to and what I'm trying to inspire you guys to commit to. Embrace and promote your Christian identity. Remove all other identities from your social media stuff, platforms, and, and tell everybody, I'm a Christian. In some way, if you're not on social media, Get you a cross, get something, get you a, some fearless gear, something that lets people know who you're standing with. Make that a part of your primary identity. More, that identity is more important than any other identity. I'm scripture, I'm talking about it's more important than saying you're a father. It really is, because trust me, it starts with your obedience to Christ that's going to make you a good father. 
So we got to get in that mentality and it just locks you in to a behavior and a set of standards that will help improve you and help improve the world. The other thing uh, we're asking is that <clears throat> uh, you talk about Jesus daily. Make him a part of your conversation. If you're running around talking about Obama and Trump and those names fall out of your mouth more than Jesus, you're doing something wrong. And so that advice is a tiny bit self-serving because the content of this show is trying to make it easy for you to talk about Jesus. Russell Westbrook does something silly at a basketball game and I come on here and tell you how that connects to his lack of a Christian identity, his lack of a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. And so I'm giving you this content every day, trying to take the things that are in popular culture and things you're naturally talking about and giving you a way to talk about them from a biblical point of view. Make Jesus and God a part of your daily conversation. But not, don't just save him for, I'll talk about him on Sunday. Oh, I'll talk about him on Wednesday at Bible study. Every day. And we're giving you a cheat sheet on this show. At some point, there's going to be someone come on this show and we'll have some kind of conversation about the sports world, about what's going on in pop culture or what's going on in politics, and we're going to connect it to God. So if you're struggling to make Jesus a part of your daily conversation, watch this show. We'll help you do it. And then the, the, the third thing, uh, which I think I actually <laughs> said second was, and this is a really easy one. Start your day, spend some time each day listening to gospel music. Your drive into work, your drive home from work, in the morning when you're uh, getting showered, shaving, eating breakfast, whatever, put some gospel music on. It will tune your heart and mind. It will get you in the right mindset. Music is very important. And so when you pour that gospel music in, other things get flushed out. I've, all, I've long, long loved rap music. It's degenerate, it's despicable, it's a toxin that I was pouring into my body. When I pour gospel music in, there's no room for rap. Not that commercial garbage rap, there's no room for it. It tastes like crap to me after this 15, 30 minutes, an hour of gospel music. You can't then pivot to listen to some guy uh, like E-40 talk about Captain save a -Hull. You, you just can't do it. it. It'll taste terrible. It'll make you want to throw up. So it's just those three easy things. And every time we have a roll call, I'm going to give you three more things. We're going to give you three more things to incorporate into your life. They'll probably get a little bit more difficult. This is foundational stuff that I'm giving you here. It takes no effort to do the three things I'm talking about. It takes no effort to talk about Jesus. It takes no effort to listen to gospel music. It takes no effort to say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not telling you, hey, I need you to spend an hour every Wednesday at 7.14 p.m. reading the Bible. Love for you to do it, but that's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm telling you, easy things. We're going to tune our minds and hearts, and we're going to fall back in love with God, and then watch what happens after that. These other things, I won't even have to ask you to do. You'll just do them instinctively. So... For those of you that didn't make it, that was my final message. You know, other parts of the week, Wednesday, we'll talk about some of the other messages that went on and transpired and how we connected them all together. Uh, I'll leave you with this. For those of you that attended Roll Call, you'll know what I'm talking about. We got the best player. Let's put him in the game. See you tomorrow. Like a stand off, nothing in life, like free.
freedom Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder Making all this moves for freedom I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on a corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all receiving We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I want 